As we learn about animals, we're going to move from the simplest animals to more complex ones along the way so that you can see uh, the basic ways that most scientists believe that life developed from simpler to more complex. The first group of animals we'll talk about is Phalamporifera. These are the simplest animals we have. These are the sponges. You oftentimes don't think about sponges as being animals because they don't exhibit a lot of animal-like symptoms. Uh, uh, characteristics, but they are definitely animals. They are multicellular, they're heterotrophic and ingest their food, they do not have cell walls, and that's what makes them animals. Uh, Phalamporifera, the, the word porifera means full of pores, and you can see here in the picture of the bath sponges here that they do have a lot of pores and a lot of openings. Okay, Phalamporifera are very very simple. They are multicellular, but they don't have any true tissues. They do have several different kinds of cells that do specialized jobs, but they're not really um, very well organized in terms of having tissues and organ systems. I usually say that porifera, the sponges, are just barely animals. They meet the definition, and that's just about it. The adult sponges are sessile. That means they attach to a surface and don't move around from place to place. They do have some cells that move. Uh, they have very porous bodies for filter feeding. They have lots of pores in the surface of the body. And on the inside of the body, they have some cells that, with flagella that create a current which pulls the water into the, into the sponge and then allows them to filter out things in the water like phytoplankton and um, zooplankton and other kinds of small pieces like that. Sponges are asymmetrical. They don't have any body symmetry. If you, if you cut them in half, uh, they don't really, the other half, the halves, two halves don't look like each other. Our bodies are bilaterally symmetrical, meaning that if you cut us in half from, from head to toe, we have more or less mirror image sides, the left side and the right side, that have basically the same parts, two eyes, two ears, two arms, two legs, etc. Sponges don't exhibit any kind of symmetry, so they are asymmetrical. Sponges can reproduce sexually and asexually, depending on the conditions they're in. They are hermaphroditic, meaning that they have both sex organs in the same, or both sex, uh, they produce both sperm and eggs from the same body. Um, but animals that are hermaphroditic don't generally self-fertilize. They generally exchange gametes with another individual of their species. This is a really important characteristic for uh, species that exist as solitary members rather than as, as in a colonial or community group. Because any time they come across another member <coughs> of their species, they are able to exchange gametes and reproduce. Uh, sponges can also reproduce asexually by budding. So here we can see basically how this works. In asexual reproduction, a bud will form uh, off of the side, one side of the sponge, and eventually break off and attach to the ground uh, and become a new sessile adult. In terms of sexual reproduction, uh, the sponge can produce egg cells and sperm cells. Generally, the sperm cells are shed into the water. The egg cells generally remain inside the sponge. When the uh, collar cells, or the, the cells inside the sponge that um, that create the current uh, come in contact with sperm cells, they basically engulf the sperm cell uh, and then implant inside the, um, the egg cell and fertilize it. Once the fertilization occurs and cell division begins, then, there, then an embryo forms that eventually produces a plankton amphiblastula larva. larva. This is a larva that can uh, basically swim with some flagellated cells and it will leave the, the sponge body, go out into the water, and eventually settle as it develops and attach to the bottom of the surface and grow into a new sponge. The structure of most sponges is, is more or less like this. There is uh, there's a, a place where it's attached to the surface, of course. There are pores in the outer surface in the central cavity there, and then an opening at the top called an osculum. When the uh, collar cells, which, are, which line the, the uh, cavity, the central cavity, uh, move their flagella, they create a current uh, which brings the water in through the pore cells there and up through the central cavity and out the osculum at the top. And as that occurs, then the collar cells can also trap uh, plankton and other small things that in the water that can be consumed. 
by the sponge. There are several different kinds of cells in the sponge. These cells right here on the outside would be equivalent to an epidermis. They're not a true epidermal tissue, but they are the outer layer of cells. The specialized collar cells that remain open and allow the water to flow in the, the, I mean the uh, pore cells. The collar cells kind of look like they have a stand-up collar and they also have flagella that attach and so they, the flagella uh, are going to beat and create that current and then the collar cells can trap food particles, ingest them, and then digest and share nutrients with the other cells. There are some cells, uh, cells called amoebocytes that actually look like amoebas and can move around like amoebas that can take some of those um, nutrients from the collar cells and pass them along to the other cells that need nutrients. They act sort of like a, a circulatory system, but not exactly. These uh, triangular kind of structures that you see here are called spicules. They're basically skeletal fibers. They're secreted by some of the cells in the sponge um, to produce a structure that can help support the outer walls. Uh, spicules can be made of a number of different substances. The ones in um, squishy sponges or like bath type sponges uh, are made of a substance called spongin. Some spicules are made of calcium carbonate which is the same stuff that corals are made of and, and, uh, and uh, eat seashells. And then uh, some of them are also made of, cal of silicon dioxide which is glass. Uh, there's first some kinds of, of sponges called glass sponges that have those kinds of spicules. So a lot, there is a fair amount of variety here, but again, very, very simple animals, not very complex, not a whole lot of structures, uh, no real tissues, and um, just barely animals. The next phylum in our uh, in complexity would be the phylum Cnidaria. Notice the word is spelled with a C in the front, but we don't pronounce the C. Uh, this includes jellyfish, corals, sea anemones, and animals like this. And yes, we've got several pictures here from Finding Nemo, because because Nemo and Marlin lived in a sea anemone, which is a Cnidarian. And then here's Dory seeing the little squishy that began to sting her when she encountered the jellyfish. Cnidarians are diploblastic, so they do have true tissues. They have two layers of tissues, though. Uh, they don't develop that third layer, the endoderm, there. Um, they have an epidermis, the outer layer, and then an, the endodermis becomes something called the gastrodermis. Gastro means stomach, and so this is basically the digestive surface that covers the digestive cavity that they have. Cnidarians exhibit radial symmetry. That means they have symmetry around an axis. If you took a knife and cut this sea anemone in half, here or here or here, any axis that you might cut it on, you would get relatively equal um, mirror image sides. There are two basic body forms of the cnidarian, the medusa form, which has the tentacles and the mouth pointing toward the bottom, underneath like a jellyfish and the polyp form which has the mouth and the tentacles at the top more like um, a sea anemone or a, a coral. Cnidarians have these two body forms. The, the uh, polyp form is generally an asexual stage and the medusa form would be a, se a sexual stage. Some cnidarians go through an alternation of generations that, where they alternate between a polyp form and a medusa form. Others spend more, most of their life, if not all of their life, as one form or the other. Sea anemones are always polyps, as are corals. Jellyfish, uh, the medusas are produced generally by a polyp form uh, that is, that in the terms of the main jellyfish, is really a, a minor part of the life cycle. Uh, and there are lots of different kinds of, of cnidarians, uh, lots of different kinds of jellies, lots of different kinds of, of various polyp forms uh, that you see in various places in the world. They have a nervous system uh, called a nerve net. It's not really, they don't have a brain, but they do have a, a network of nerves throughout their body. Then that allows them to respond to stimuli. Their digestive uh, cavity is called a gastrovascular cavity and is lined with the gastrodermis there and this is how they digest their food. There's only one opening, we call this a, an incomplete digestive system or a GVC for gastrovascular cavity. There's one opening, the tentacles uh, capture the food, bring it into the mouth, 
there and then the gastrodermis can secrete digested enzymes and break down the um, the food the the animal that they're eating um, into uh, nutrients and then the waste what they can't digest or what they can't use is pushed back out through the mouth so there's one opening the mouth or anus and then the gastrovascular cavity now they do have some very specialized cells called nidocytes. Nidocytes contain nematocysts, which are little um, little stinging barbs, basically, that can be released when they come in contact with by the by the uh, cnidarian when they come in contact with their with something comes in contact with their tentacles. Um, tentacles are lined with lots and lots of these nematocysts, and basically they shoot out this little barb, this little poison dart that sticks in their prey and can pump uh, toxins into the prey. Uh, this is why it stings when you touch a jellyfish uh, and also sometimes when, when you touch corals or sea anemones they, they can also sting you in the same way. Uh, Portuguese man of war which is a type of a cnidarian um, is said to be the sixth most venomous or poisonous marine animal so they actually produce a whole lot of toxin and can hurt you quite badly so be careful when you go to the beach and don't step on them. Corals are polyp forms that form something called a reef. The reef looks like a big organism or a big piece of rock basically but it's really a colony with thousands of coral polyps living together. When you look at a coral, at the coral rock that you're used to seeing, uh, look at the surface and there are many tiny little pits in there and each pit uh, when the coral is living in the water each pit will be filled with a polyp. The polyps secrete the calcium carbonate, um, the limestone type substance um, that makes the, makes the coral rocks. The colors that you see oftentimes in corals come from symbiotic relationships with dinoflagellates or algae in the water. It takes lots of time to form a reef. They're pretty easily damaged um, if you're not really careful with them. They are very active and diverse ecosystems. They serve as a home to 25% of marine species, which is about 2 million species. And if you think back to when you saw Finding Nemo, you can think about all the rich life forms that you found around the coral reef, which is where Nemo and Marlin lived to begin with. However, these days about a fourth of all reefs on Earth are considered damaged beyond repair, and about two-thirds of them are considered under serious threat. A lot of the threat has to do with the global warming, which is producing a, a global a warming of the oceans, and also acidification of the ocean water, which kind of helps kind of dissolve or make it more difficult to produce the, the coral, the calcium carbonate.